and I was on Wall Street. We loved Greenspan because every time he opened his mouth, he printed more money. Greenspan started printing money like crazy. We had the tech bubble. Tech bubble crashes. He prints even more money. We have the housing bubble. Greenspan's housing bubble crashes. Bernanke prints even more money, right? <laughs> and and we basically had 10 years of a, of a of a growing stock bubble that now is an insane stock bubble. You know, I was actually thinking about this this morning and it goes back to the, the, the famous Meyer Rothschild quote, give me control of the country's money supply and I don't give a crap who makes the rules. Well, that's where we are right now. <laughs> Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics and Denver Dave Kranzler. As always, joining me for the silver and gold market update. Um, and certainly an uh, interesting week. Dave, I know you uh, must be thrilled with the Fed and their, their, their keen guidance, which now includes buying individual corporate bonds as well. So <laughs> you couldn't make some of this stuff up. I mean, even if you tried... So Dave, uh, aside from the Fed's corporate bond purchases, how are you doing today? <laughs> corporate bond purchases, I mean, that's not enough to ruin my day. It completely disgusts me, but <laughs> that's not what would put me in a grumpy mood. So away from that, I'm doing great. <laughs> Well, what, what would it do? Let's say we took where you are now and we know the Fed's been buying ETFs. What, what are the chances they're buying at GLD and SLV? How ironic would that be if that, somehow I'm guessing that's not on their purchase list, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean. It's actually a good question. <laughs> that's, that's about the only headline we haven't heard out of the Fed in the past couple of months. Maybe that, okay, we cracked it. That will be the sign when you finally know gold and silver prices are about to rip once the Fed starts buying GLD and SLV. So we'll keep a radar out for that one. So Dave, we had a question, a couple of questions from some readers that they wanted to hear what Denver Dave thinks. Um, first of which is whether the banks would be long metal. We hear the reports that JP Morgan uh, has a large pile of silver. How big, uh, I guess, depends on what you want to look at. But I'm curious, do you think that they have gotten long as much physical metal as some are reporting? And then B, will is that a, a possible scenario that the banks would be able to get long, maybe pawn the posi short position off to the tech funds and then let the prices rip at some point? Well, first of all, I mean, to, to make assertions that specific banks own a certain amount of metal is is crazy because there's no way to there's no way to verify it there's just no way and i mean just just because jp morgan reports in the delivery reports that is taking delivery for its house account a certain amount of contracts i mean there's no way to know if that if the gold really changes hands if it ever leaves the vaults if you know if it's coming from un, you know, if it's unallocated gold that moves into a J.P. Morgan allocated section of the J.P. Morgan, I, I just not, it, the whole thing is so opaque; it's impossible to know for sure. Right. So, I mean, you can conjecture, and and you know, there were reports several years ago about um, some of the big banks putting putting up vaults or building vaults in places like Singapore. And Hong Kong, and I think Shanghai now. So, um, I mean, you know, the thing of it is, what I think gets lost sometimes in the discussion is is that well, two things: a, the banks are manipulating the price of gold, and you know, so the central banks. But I mean. It, I don't know what the ownership structure is for the ECB or the BOE or the Bank of Japan, but in this country, the banks own the Fed. Yeah. You know, people think it's because of the name, it was a brilliant name selection. People think that it's part of the 
federal government. Oh, Federal Reserve, part of no, it's not. It's a private corporation. And if you look at the ownership structure, there's 12 regional banks. And the banks in those regions that are members of that regional Fed Reserve Bank own, own the stock of those regional Fed banks. So when you consolidate the whole thing, you've got basically something called the Federal Reserve that's owned by the banks. So it's not the FOMC that's that's defining the narrative that comes out of the Fed, it's the banks. And, and the New York Fed is by far the most powerful of the regional Federal Reserve banks. And, and that's, that's the one where banks like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs own the shares of the New York Fed. So the reason why the, why the banks are manipulating the price of gold is it supports the, the fiat US dollar, right? And I think that I think people kind of pretty much understand that. I, I wrote several articles along with Paul Craig Roberts about four or five years ago, and they're somewhere on my blog. You can pull them up and read them. But um, you know, with his help, we made it clear that the primary motive for capping the price of gold or trying to prevent the price of gold from going higher is to support the dollar, and because every you know, every time the gold goes up a hundred bucks, people have to say, geez, why is this happening? What's wrong with the dollar? Right. Yep. So that, that that's, that's the thing. I mean, you know, the banks are the central banks, the big banks, basically the two big to fail banks, you know, are the most powerful shareholders of the federal reserve and they manipulate the price of gold because if, you know, I was actually thinking about this this morning, and it goes back to the, the, the famous Meyer Rothschild quote, give me control of a country's money supply, and I don't give a crap who makes the rules. Well, that's where we are right now. The banks have complete control of the money supply, and they have for, well, essentially since, since I mean, you can kind of argue where the line of demarcation is when the banks didn't have control versus when they had control. But, you know, let's just say starting with Greenspan, that's where it really became evident. You know, and people looked back and, you know, and I was on Wall Street, we loved Greenspan because every time he opened his mouth, <laughs> printed more money, our bonuses got bigger. <laughs> and this was in the 90s. So now the bonuses are 10x the bonuses we were getting. Well, maybe not that much bigger, but 5x. So, and it's all a function of the amount of money that the central bank, that the Fed has been printing. So, you know, Greenspan started printing money like crazy. We had the tech bubble. Tech bubble crashes. He prints even more money. We have the housing bubble. Bernanke takes over. Housing bubble. Greenspan's housing bubble crashes. Bernanke prints even more money, right? <laughs> and, and we basically had 10 years of a, of, a, of a growing stock bubble that now is an insane stock bubble. Um, what's her face the the little midget woman takes over for for bernanke you know and says oh there's never going to be another economic crisis in this country because you know we can control the economy with the money supply well how's that work i mean you've got even all during this period you've had you know minimally 30 percent of the working age population considered unemployed many of them getting entitlement benefits Many of them would like a job, but you know they're better off not working because they get paid more not to work. We're seeing that happen right now, right? With these various programs that the government has. But at, at any rate, the banks essentially have control of the money supply and that's what gives them power. And that's what allows them to transfer all this wealth to you know the billionaires that control the banks and to themselves. Right, we've had an, an an incredible transfer of wealth to the, you know, people say the upper ten percent or the upper one percent. No, it's mostly the upper half a percent of the wealth of the of the people who hold the wealth. So, um, are the banks are the banks buying gold? I would assume that they probably are because I'm sure they know exactly what they're doing, and there's no reason for them to to stop trying to manipulate or control the price of gold because right now they're still accumulating and getting all this wealth transferred to them.
And that's what the fiat currency system allows them to do and their control of it. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, I think they're kind of doing the same thing that China's doing. Hey, we're going to accumulate all this metal as we can, as much as we can, while the price is still cheap relative to, you know, the total amount of fiat currency circulating in the global system. And when we, you know, when we feel like we're done transferring all this wealth, you know, then maybe they, you know, they, they let the fiat currencies go. And we're probably not too far from that point. But when you say not too far in terms of these types of um, dynamics, you know, not too far could mean another five or 10 years, who knows? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think what you could end up having on the other side of this is you'll have, you know, the banks and the, and the guys that, that control the banks and own the banks, and they're going to have, you know, the majority of the above ground physical gold and silver in their possession. So, um, are the banks accumulating gold and silver? I would assume they're not idiots, and they probably are. How much they've accumulated, there's just no way to know. And well, I, I, Dave, think it's, I think it's not responsible to throw out numbers <laughs> like some of these guys do. I mean, it, it, it makes for good headlines, and it probably helps sell newsletters and subscriptions, but um, there's just no way to know. Well, I agree with that. What I will say, however... What I will say, however, is that the system, the way it's set up, if you really look at it, it was set up intentionally opaque and it becomes, and you know, remember they were supposed to make the LBMA fix process more transparent. Well, now it's even more opaque than it was before. You know, it's this thing where whatever these guys in power say, it's really the opposite. That's probably the truth. So, hey, we're gonna make the, the Fed's gonna make itself more transparent. Remember that? I think that was um, when Janet Yellen, you know, took over. That's going to make itself more transparent. It's become less transparent. And, and right now, they don't even have to release the, the um, minutes to their FOMC meetings. They're not just, you know, Congress has, has had to subpoena the Fed in order to get the identities of, of the banks that have been recipients of, of the, um, you know, the various programs where the, where the Fed's just handing cash to the banks. I mean, that, that payroll protection program, I just, I just read an article, Citibank, which supposedly is in great financial health, it, it was given $3 billion under the, the payroll protection plan. So what the heck? <laughs> I mean, that stimulus bill sure seemed to me like a bank bailout. It is a bank bailout. It's nothing, it's nothing short of a bank bailout. And anyone who thinks any differently is either completely naive or a complete idiot or just com completely ignorant of, of what's really going on. Yeah, and Dave, you also mentioned that LBMA in there, which I had to chuckle at them this week because they were, I guess there's a, a saga now between them and the Perth Mint where the LBMA was, I guess, uh, chastising the Perth Mint because of how they've, dealt with artisanal miners, which I don't have the first clue what happened there. Although it just seemed ironic the LBMA get, you know, they, they've had like an adventuresome year already that they're giving advice to anyone. Again, this is an organization, I believe one of the guys running it was the same guy that, uh, or maybe it was a board of director, was one of the guys that, J, that the Department of Justice threw in when they labeled J.P. Morgan a, a criminal enterprise and charged them with the RICO statute. So it's you know, very... That did, right? Boy, that really bothered J.P. Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually did hear something interesting about that whole Department of Justice that I don't know is public to share yet, uh, but gives me a little optimism. I... Not that much optimism, yeah, but don't, don't get your hopes up. I mean, I guess it goes back to what you said earlier with, uh, and I appreciate you pointed out how the Fed is owned by the banks because it's like, it's, it's funny where, you know, the, so if the treasury wants to spend money that they don't have and they have to print, they're selling it. Everyone thinks the Fed as this, you know, regal institution. But what I always found quite amusing was the Fed, like you said, owned by the banks, but supposedly to block a conflict of interest, the treasury can't go directly to the Fed. They have to have an agent. So it's like when the, the treasury is print, wants money to fund stuff they can't afford, 
they actually have to pay Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan a fee to sell it to J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs as part of the Fed. I mean, it's really, it's maybe like four card Monty, three card Monty, not big enough. I mean, it, but you really couldn't make some of this up. And maybe I wonder more and more if part of the design is to make people think it's legitimate when they, these guys know darn well how fraudulent it is and, you know, but you get people angry and, you know, trying to outsmart it and take a lot of money away. Well, I mean, I, I think the general population, I think that they know something is messed up, something's really wrong, but they, you know, I don't think, you know, very few people take the time to sit down and really understand how that, with the mechanism that you just described, how it works and what it means. But I can guarantee you, if you told people, you just went out, you know, like that Mark Dice guy who, um, <laughs> yeah, him. <laughs> I'm going to start doing that at your tennis matches. I'm going to walk around with an ounce of silver and some chewy and a Hershey bar. Which I'm not hooked on anymore, by the way. And we'll see if anyone, how many people do you think would choose the silver? I don't know. If I go by his videos, no one chooses the silver. <laughs> <laughs> but so i mean if you put the proposition in front of a group of people and said hey um we can we can cut spending balance try to balance the budget um stop issuing new debt but it means that you're probably going to be in a world of pain you're going to lose your job and you're going to have trouble feeding your family if we don't if we don't create more government spending you know, so that's your two options. You know, the Fed prints money and buys new bonds via the banks who could get a nice markup on the bonds. And you guys can go on with your daily lives as is, or we can stop all this and the system collapses. I mean, what choice do you think people are going to take? I mean, they, it's not just, you know, now that I think about it, you see all these articles, well, the Fed's backed itself into a corner. The whole country's backed into a corner. And I'm, um, you know, I think it was intentional, and not not intentional with like, oh, you know, we, we want to control everything. I think it was, you know, hey, if we keep doing this, we're gonna put take a lot of money and put it into our own pockets, and you know, who cares what the consequences are? Well, now we're starting to understand. Well, we're starting to understand the consequences. I don't know that because most people are, you know, you bore them to death if you started talking about this stuff. So. They're disinterested, and that's that's kind of what enables the, the boiled frog syndrome that we're in right now. I mean, the, the water's been turned up just to the point of, of boiling, and they're getting ready to turn it up so that it boils. Yeah, I can understand that, although I would say, well, maybe there's still a lot of people that don't care. I've been stunned at whether it's some of the folks from the mining companies that I talk with or the bullion dealerships that... I mean, there's money coming in from the mainstream now. This isn't just the gold and silver bugs, and understandably so, because what are what are people supposed to say when Fed's doing unlimited QE, comes out last week, says we're never raising interest rates again, then this week they're buying corporate bonds. I don't, I don't know how you change that at any point. I think it's only well, going to be a matter of more people money, seeing it. When you say money coming in from the mainstream, I mean – from the time I started doing this sector back in 2001 until, well, probably up until now, you know, you're talking about probably half a percent of the population maybe buys gold and silver, you know, and they may have inherited some stuff from their grandparents or their parents. Um, you know, I know a guy who inherited a huge silver coin collection from his father, and he didn't know what to, he asked me, what should I do with this? You know, and, and uh, so, I mean, when they say that they're seeing a lot of money flow in from the, from the you know, general public, you know, maybe that means 1% of the public now is starting to buy gold and silver. I mean, if, if you had 10 or 15% of the public start to buy a lot of gold and silver, then you would see a big squeeze in the in the in the um, 
pulling on distribution system. And that, I, that's, that's when you'd see a big move higher in the price. I agree with everything you said there. I'm just saying that from my perspective, I, you know, it, it, yeah, you may well be right that it's only one or 2% now, but with the policies that are in place, I just think that's going to continue to grow because people aren't complete morons. And when you lie directly to their faces long enough and then the lies become more and more flimsy, I think they wake up and we'll see. Although Dave, uh, one last question we had for you today. Another well, let, let's just put this to the test, right? I mean, if I, if I look outside of the very close tight knit circle of people I know that are in the precious metal sector and you're, you and Trevor Hall are probably the only ones in Denver. I don't know how much gold or silver Trevor buys, but um, uh, do you have any treasure? I don't know anyone friends? socially. I don't know anyone socially in Denver or in New York because I lived in New York for 15 years. I don't know anyone in either of those two places that actually buy or own physical gold and silver unless they inherited some sort of coin collection from their from their ancestors. Well, we, you got to come join us at one of our Monday morning coffee and metals meetups where we're bringing them in. We're meeting new folks. I'm not saying it's an avalanche yet. I'm just saying that we are getting orders from people that basically say, hey, I'm scared about what I see in the stock market. Right. And I, under, I understand that. But I'm, what I'm saying is maybe that means that you'll have instead of half a percent of the population with savings. <laughs> Moving, moving that savings into gold and silver, now maybe it's 1%. I mean, first of all, you can say, well, 80% of the population doesn't even have savings. Nothing. So they're not buying gold and silver. You know? And then most of the people say between, you know, in the, um, say from 1% down to 20%, they have high income jobs, but they're, they're loaded with debt, mortgage, auto debt, Call, you know, college debt for their kids. I don't think that most of those people are buying gold and silver. I think it's a very small sliver of the percent of the population that actually has savings and ha and generates income over and above, you know, their, their fixed expenses every month. You know, a very small percentage of that is actually buying gold and silver. I know a lot of dudes at this tennis club I belong to who make a fortune and they don't buy gold and silver. They think I'm a nut for buying gold and silver. You got to give them the weekly Denver Dave silver and gold market update so they can understand it. They can Thanks. hit the share button, tweet it with their friends. And... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, but, you know, and I guess that's how it goes. I'll bet. See, to me, I, I guess the bigger point was that whatever the number is, to me, it's like the Fed is going to guarantee the number is going to grow at what pace, you know, we could debate for hours, but it's like they're guaranteeing that number is going to grow and they're guaranteeing they're going to make it easier and more obvious, you know, and yeah, probably most of the people at the tennis club won't get it, but I think it'll be fun to show up there with my camera, you know, a year from now or whenever it happens when the price is there and we'll see how quickly they change their tune. I think that will happen quite a bit. And, you know, again, why I appreciate that you come on the show. I appreciate the, you know, not just that you're come on here, but for the last 20 years, you spent, you've stood there and researched this stuff. Um, so that the people who, who want to know and want to see it can, and that's all you can do. And, Fortunately, your, your ratings continue to be strong here. So Dave, before we wrap up, I'm going to pick up mom from the airport today. She's coming to visit. Maybe we can come deliver your Got Silver t-shirt in person. But until then, for folks who just can't wait until next week for your next appearance, uh, just mention the <laughs> site and what you have going on there. I got him chuckling. You're thinking about your God Silver yoga pants again, but come on, stay <laughs> focused, buddy. Okay, I will give the preview of this site. Oh, I didn't know I was supposed to preview the site. 
Yeah, what are, what are folks going to get there when they go over to investment research dynamics? Well, probably a lot of free articles that make it look like I'm a windbag <laughs> and um, some nice links there to my newsletters and to the Mining Stock Daily, which Trevor Hall uh, is the 95% producer of and I'm the 5% producer of. Yeah, and what, what happened here, buddy? That's an old picture. I, I don't know where these guys get these pictures for some of these podcasts. Somebody um, asked you if you wanted to buy treasuries and that was your <laughs> response. I don't even remember where that picture was taken. <laughs> but that is the kind of good stuff that you can find on investment research dynamics. You can find the short sellers journal, also the mining stock journal, which will be coming out next Thursday and I'll be looking forward to. Um, so Dave, appreciate you being here as always. Um, gonna be interesting times. I think we're gonna see some fireworks in the second half of the year. Um, I think the Fed will guarantee that for us. We'll see how quickly it plays out, but thanks as always for being here. And folks, if you want to hear the latest update of what's been going on on the physical level of the market, well, stay tuned because here it is coming.